Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Success Thursday this week with Youssef Fahoum. Hi, Youssef. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. How are you? Very good. Thank you for asking. Today's Thursday, of course, it's Success Thursday, where we talk about what does it mean for us to be successful as Scrum Masters. But there is one tool we use for that, the retrospectives. And we want to know first, before we dive into the success question, what's your favorite retrospective format and why? There's so many, but I think I always come back to the Starfish Retro, where I draw, poorly draw, a <laughs> sea star on the marker board. And uh, in between each of the arms is a, is a category of something the team wants to do more of, less of, keep doing, stop doing, or start doing. Why have you come back to that format over and over? Like, what do you see in it that helps you as a scrum master? For me, my style, I was saying um, earlier that I'm kind of, I tell people I'm kind of goofy at the marker board because it helps, it helps me relax and it helps the team talk because I'm just making a fool of myself. But it helps me have a conversation with the team because it's kind of like a, a brainstorming more than let's say the sailboat, you know, retrospective. It helps the team with just brainstorming ideas. And I tell people, all of the ideas are possible. You know, even if you want to start doing, somebody wants to start doing something, somebody else will say, well, I want to stop doing that. It's okay. It's okay. Because we're trying to get all the ideas on the board and everything's relevant. And pretty soon through the process of that and accepting everybody's opinion, I literally have drawn lines connecting ideas to, and every single time I'll be able to get to that silver thread that is the problem or the problem that the issue that the team wants to fix. So what you're saying is that by generating these ideas, you can find patterns and connections that highlight something that is not even necessarily being talked about. That's right. Because as soon as we start accepting everybody's opinion about what, if they want to start or stop or do more of, that's the pattern. The pattern is the why. Why do you want to stop doing it? Why do you want to do more of it? And the team starts really talking, being open because they've already agreed consciously or subconsciously to accept each other's opinions as a brainstorm session. And once we do that, and there's no judgment or less judgment on our opinion of something, then all of a sudden, all these other details pop up and the communication dynamic just explodes, typically. I think, I think that's a very great addition to the whole idea of the Starfish retrospective, this idea that let's agree to accept that these are opinions. Let's not try to judge what's a better idea or a worse idea. Let's just generate those ideas and, and uh, of course, let, later on decide which ones we want to take on as a team, independently of whether we individually want them or not. That's right. Yeah. And the idea of less judgment is also, for me, it's a great enabler for open conversation. It's not easy to get that to happen in practice, especially if you're new to the team, the team is new to you. There's a lot of judgment happening all the time. You're, you're not open enough yet at that point. But if you kind of slowly move in that direction and help the team step back from the judgment and start accepting more, start listening more, it can lead to great things. That's right. You know, it, a good example is, is I had this team... And the program manager came to me on the side and said, you know, we're kind of worried about this one teammate because he didn't talk much, but he's really brilliant. And we're just wondering if, you know, if he's being uh, marginalized by other teammates or what's going on, or maybe it's not the right place for him. Mm -hmm. I said, well, just give me a little time. So we had a retrospective and we got all the way around and, you know, I draw pictures of sharks. I'm a terrible artist on the starfish and these kind of things. And you know what it turned out to be? Somebody finally just said, well, we, we see, we'll saw a calm Bob. We see Bob's work, but he never really speaks. And we just want to hear more of him, like what his opinions are. And so I said, we want to hear Bob talk more. You know, I'm writing this on the board. And the thing was, the whole boiled down to English wasn't his first language. And I finally said, you know what? I'm going to step out of my Scrum Master Coach hat right now. I'm just going to tell you right now, you speak far better English. And I can understand you than I would ever be able to speak or do in you know, six months. So trust me, buddy. And after that, we almost can get them to shut up. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it can be simple things like that that can have a huge impact. That's right. That's a great story, right. by the way, really inspiring. All right. So now we turn our attention to the reason why we do all of this, why we have retros and why we invest so much of our time in preparing them and hosting them, which is the success question. So 
Yusef, share with us, what does success mean for you as a Scrum Master? You know, back in the day, I always said, um, I try to work myself out of a job as a Scrum Master. And occasionally I still hear Scrum Masters say that. And my battle-hardened opinion now would be, um, yeah, don't say that. Because if that you say that, you probably will work yourself out of a job. <laughs> but if you if you nuance that and say, I, get, I can get to the point where I'm not the one constantly facilitating the discussions, but I'm there to help guide them. And my teams, or the team, shouldn't be my team, the team walks into the room in a retro or in a daily stand-up or whatever it might be, and they're starting the conversations. They're the ones grabbing the mouse and moving a card over without me kind of very lightly being punitive and say, hey, why don't you move your card over this morning because you didn't do it yesterday? You know, they're the ones walking in and doing it, and they're the ones holding each other accountable. And that's a measure of success, and that you can measure. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, one of the things that we want to help our listeners with is how do I take small steps towards that? So how did you get there? Because uh, as you said, it's not about working yourself out of a job, is seeing that the team is taking ownership, is taking initiative. They are not waiting for you. But how do you start getting there? Yeah, I can tell you, um, I used to only read science fiction and I was not wanting to read anything for work. And I quickly found out that I had to dig so so much deeper into the human dynamic and, and agility in general and really learn what's going on. What is really going on around me? Um, how can I, because I can't under, just learn and understand all the technical stuff that these folks know. Three months, it's just not going to happen, you know, in the first part of engagement. And so how do I get there? I just started, I was not a reader. I Now I read all the time. I have three books going on at once constantly. And, and you start learning. So I use audiobooks, whatever. The other thing you can do is, you know, learn different ways of communicating, how to ask open-ended questions, because oftentimes we don't realize that we're asking a question, but it's what we call it. There's an Americanism, I guess you call it leading the jury. You know, you're asking a question that you already know the answer of. Everybody knows the answer of by the time you finish asking it, and there's no way around it. So you're not really opening the conversation to be free. Yeah, you're leading the conversation, right? Like that's that's a, a very different stance. Right. And it's different than a scrum master, you know, leading a retrospective. Like I can guide folks in that because I kind of see that it's going on or maybe I'll discover something. But as far as success goes, you want to always be increasing the amount of credibility, objective credibility you have with your teams. Don't dive into testing because <laughs> some scrum masters do because now you're being part of the traffic and you can't be observant of the dynamic of the traffic patterns, but now you're a car on the, on the road. So you really have to be a scientist. You have to be objective. You need to understand the technical parts as much as you can in order to, you know, filter out things like techno babble, estimation, inflation, you know, those kind of things. But for me, it was learning all those things, but always increasing credibility. And you do that by being a real leader with air quotes, a servant leader, but asking and being open and empathetic to what's going on. And when people say, well, we're not doing as well as we are and this kind of thing, look to the finding metrics. They don't have to be complicated metrics because I'm not really a good analyst guy, but I do. I can find really easy ways to figure out what's going on with the team in terms of the delivery and predictability just by doing simple observation. Yeah, absolutely. Observation is a very powerful tool. Yeah, and I still so I think for me it's you know metrics, being observant, being kind of the internal scientist with the team. Yeah, and just being part of the team. Don't try to always always trying to push my own perception or my own opinion about my, what might be happening, push that to the back of my head and just take everything on a space value and treat it as such. Because then you'll find, as a Scrum Master as a coach, you'll find that you'll learn more about the people and the teams and the dynamic that you've got going on than you ever could if you're constantly making a decision. Oh, it's because of this, oh, it's because of this. And we were talking about it when it comes to the starfish exercise, like uh, stepping out of the judgment perspective really helps a lot because at the end of the day as uh, scrum masters and coaches we know that the team knows what needs to be done but they don't always necessarily look at the things that triggers their thinking to come to that decision but if we accept that the team knows then our job is to actually guide them through the thinking process not to the solution but through the thinking process like you described in the in the starfish exercise a minute ago. Yeah, if we're, if we're trying, constantly trying to be the boss or to um, assume that we know what's going on, 
do it. I mean, it's a good way to not succeed. <laughs> <In my case. laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with us, Yusef. Thank you. Part of a successful Scrum Master job is to help the product owner. Tomorrow we explore that critical role in Scrum, the product owner role. Tune in to learn about the product owner anti-patterns, what you can do to help the product owner, and a real-life example of what a great product owner is and what made it so. Tomorrow on our Friday product owner episode. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.